this is module seven of the training for the North Carolina Department of Transportation Erosion and Sediment Control Certification Program covering the erosion and sediment control plans. The instructor is Rich McLaughlin, professor in the Department of Crop and Soil Sciences at North Carolina State University. The erosion and sediment control plan is your guide to what measures are needed and where they should be located on a project. It is critical to review the plan carefully as it often has very specific information about how erosion and sediment control needs to be implemented on the project. The plan is not written in stone and should be updated as needed as a project progresses. This is a table you'll have to know in order to pass the test. Just kidding. The reason we are showing this table is to provide you with an idea of how decisions are made about what measures should go where. This is done by the designer who wrote the plan. While some adjustments can be made in the field, these items below should not be changed from what is shown on the plan. Riser basins, which are typically used for stormwater after the project is completed, Temporary rock sediment dams type A, temporary rock sediment dams type B at stream crossings and drainage turnouts, temporary rock silt checks type A, any culvert construction sequencing, and finally, any stream channel changes that have been put into the design. There are a number of goals for an erosion and setup control plan and guiding the contractor on the following. Identifying areas critical to high erosion and also vulnerable off-site areas. Limit the size and time of exposed areas. Manage stormwater runoff so it flows into the best management practices. Control sediment by ponding runoff at different locations and also manage natural surface waters if they occur on the project. As a reminder, how are we removing sediment from runoff? Because of the large amounts of sediment typically in construction site runoff, filtering is not possible. We are not aware of any scrubbing technology available for muddy water. So we are left with settling it, pooling the runoff long enough for gravity to pull out at least the larger particles. Having a plan is one thing, but making it work on the ground is just as important. Here are some of the most common problems that occur when plans are not followed. Runoff bypassing the devices installed. Not getting the best management practices in place before the bulldozers start their work, exposing the soil to erosion. Not paying attention to the maintenance needed, such as sediment buildup behind a device failing to establish a ground cover in exposed areas within a reasonable time. Incorrect sizing of ditches and basins so they cannot handle the flows. Overall, remember your goal is to follow the plan but also manage runoff. There may be additional BMPs needed as work progresses. Here's an example of the front page of an erosion and sediment control plan. As mentioned before, there will always be a key to all those symbols that are on the subsequent uh, pages of the plan. Here's the key from that page. Not only are the symbols explained, but notes are there regarding the project. Here, the note indicates that this plan is for clearing and grubbing as opposed to, say, the final grade. The next note tells you that the design was for sensitive watersheds. If you recall, that generally means larger basins and shorter times for ground covers to be established. Lastly, the note tells you that environmentally sensitive areas are on the project. This could be a trout stream, mussels in the creeks, or similar types of situations. This is a page from a, the plan showing all the devices and their location, as well as the environmentally sensitive areas. We'll zoom in on this bridge crossing area to look at details.
So on closer examination, you can see where, for instance, there's a skimmer basin that needs to be installed. It's got its dimensions as well as the orifice diameter for the skimmer in the, in the diagram. The blue arrow show us the flow of the stream, which gives you an idea that obviously there has to be a bridge built here. And there's our basin location. As a review, what would you say are good guidance principles for getting erosion and setup control plans implemented on the project? Hopefully everybody agrees that all three of these would be excellent ways to get your plans implemented. As we discussed in the regulations section, any work in jurisdictional areas, streams, wetlands, estuaries, etc., needs to get permits from the appropriate agencies. We'll review how that translates onto your plan. These symbols provide guidance as to what the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has agreed to happening in their jurisdiction. Each of these will appear on the plan as shown in the specific location on the project. For example, mechanized clearing means heavy equipment can be brought in, but hand clearing, shown here, means just people with chainsaws, so no removal of debris. The North Carolina Division of Water Resources also has symbols for work in riparian zones one and two. In this case, mitigable means that NCDOT will repair areas off the project in trade for these impacts, while allowable means no offsite repairs are needed. Here's an example of a stream crossing which is not a high quality water and no buffer is required. The hash marks you see on either side of the stream are where the flagging should be placed to keep equipment out of the stream itself. Also shown is the right of way, this RW, the limit of fill, which is this F and the dash mark, as well as the easement boundary, the E on the outside. Here it is an example of those restrictions that are part of the permit. The area of this wetland shown can be cleared of vegetation, but no grading activities are allowed. Note the special provisions shown regarding what practices can be installed and how they need to be managed. Right there. Here is an example of fill in a wetland and how it needs to be managed. Flagging will be placed in the wetland to show the contract, contractor the limits of fill material, shown right there. In addition, an area between the flagging and the perimeter fence, shown right here, the shaded area, will be allowed to have mechanical clearing. In this area, or in this example, the area will be allowed to have hand clearing only under the bridge that's being constructed. So a crew with chainsaws will go in and lay down all the vegetation, but leave it all in place. As before, only silt fence can be installed and any sediment that accumulates needs to be removed. This is another example of hand clearing which is allowed in the bridge area. Fill will be brought into the wetland areas as shown here. And then on the outside in the shaded area, hand clearing will be allowed. This is what a fill in a wetland looks like. Notice all the area with the cross hatching and the Fs. In addition, if you look over here, you'll see temporary fill, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Remember, we were talking about placing dams in the stream to allow construction of a culvert or bridge with pumping or moving the water in some flow outside of the work area. That is technically a fill in a stream, so a permit will be needed as shown in this diagram. Fill here, fill here, work area in between.
Here is an example of environmentally sensitive areas around a stream. Notice how the flagging in crosshatch right there is set up outside of this area to prevent disturbance within the environmentally sensitive area. In this example, there's a stream channel which is going to be put through a wetland and so there's going to be allowable excavation in that area, E with the cross hatching. Sometimes there needs to be temporary fill in order to build a bridge or a similar structure. Here you can see the T with cross hatching indicating where that will occur. Generally it is done on the existing topography with geotextile underneath the fill and once completed the fill is removed along with the liner and then the site should be relatively undisturbed. Here's another example of a temporary fill, but in this case, it is in surface waters where bridge supports or similar are needed to be installed. Here you see the TS with the cross hatching. As with other temporary fills, this needs to be removed and the area returned to as close as before as possible. Remember those mitigable impact areas, which are traded for improving other sites off the project? This shows an example of the zone one buffer in the uh, checkered zone. And this is an area where you can have extension, extensive uh, excavation and other disturbances. On the same stream, we have zone two where also you can have quite a bit of disturbance. As in the previous two slides, this is an example of buffers having allowed disturbance. Here you can see where the jurisdictional flagging is. Again, the, the hash marks right through here, where the flagging is placed to ensure that the contractor understands that these are special zones that need special treatment. The other type of disturbance in the buffers are the allowable impacts. And again, here's zone one with the cross hatching, slightly different pattern to show you what kinds of things can be put in here. So remember, these are all allowable inside, but they're temporary and they should be removed. And then over into zone two, same thing. We've got temporary measures, but we've added slope drains and the type C or stormwater inlet protection, storm drain inlet protection. And all these will be removed once the bridge is completed. So quick review question from your regulation section. Which agency would issue a 404 permit for putting those impermeable dikes into a stream during a bridge project? All right, if you remember 404 comes from the Army Corps of Engineers. This completes the level two erosion and sediment control plans module.